Great. All right. So the title of this talk is easily accessible. And I'm going to start off with a number, 20%. Does anyone here know what that number represents? No hands are going up. So what that number represents are the approximate percentage of Americans, United States citizens, that self-reported as having a disability in the 2010, that should have said, the 2010 census. What that means when you think about it is that one in every five people sitting in this room right now or one person in this photo has a disability or may very well have a disability. Those are the types of disabilities that you might report. So those are what we would consider sort of the known or non-temporary disabilities, more the permanent ones. Because if you're going to report a disability on a census, it's not going to be a temporary one such as, say, a concussion. So the actual numbers of people who might have a disability, who are around you or in your workplace or interacting with your experience at any given point in time, probably significantly higher than that 20% number. But 20% is the absolute baseline. So one of the things that I encounter in my work is that it's often an uphill battle to argue with clients or stakeholders as to why they should spend money on accessible products. But when you put that 20% baseline number in front of them, if you're talking about a consumer site where there's actual revenue going through the, the site, you're talking a significant amount of money right there. So that is probably the best argument that I can give you as a takeaway, which is why we're starting with that number. But let's talk a little bit more about what we're covering. So our goal here today is not only to really define what makes digital products, and notice I'm saying digital products, I'm not saying websites or applications. As Drupal developers, we are expanding beyond those basic frameworks. Our, did, our Drupal work is powering things like 10-foot displays. Our Drupal work is powering screens and televisions and other types of interactive spaces throughout the world. So we are talking about digital products now. We're no longer talking about just websites and applications as Drupal developers. So how do we make sure that they're accessible? What does that actually look like? And what is some kind of a process that can make this easy for us as we go about our work? This is actually not as hard as it sounds, especially when you have the right language with which to talk with people that you're actually trying to convince to come on board with you. And the real reason why this is important, probably not the one that you should lead in with on an argument with someone that you're trying to bring on board, but accessibility itself is a basic human right. And people who have disabilities are very avid users of digital products. In fact, digital products have changed their lives. And there are people who are completely paralyzed who are able to take care of their family finances and their family shopping and do their family's banking. And this is pretty, this is remarkable. And it's because these products are actually able to make this possible. So in the course of this, uh, of this slide deck, we probably won't get through everything, but in the course of the slide deck, what are we covering? So we're gonna start out with why this matters. I'm gonna give you a little bit more sort of context of what what you're going to be thinking about because this will frame how you will approach products moving forward and approach definition and development. We're going to talk about who benefits from accessible design and then we're going to talk about the very unfortunate but incredibly useful acronym POR for poor websites which, which you will hopefully keep in your mind moving forward. Uh, we'll also go over a process or the sort of process of a digital product and creation of a digital product and what you can think about in terms of accessible design all the way through design and development. And then I do have a bunch of resources at the end that we probably won't exactly cover, but you'll be able to come back to them. So why does accessibility matter? It matters because disabilities are everywhere. And disabilities can be permanent, they can be temporary, and they can even be situational. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you think of disabilities, you probably call to mind an image of somebody who might be blind or in a wheelchair, somebody who might be deaf, somebody who maybe has some kind of motor impairment. But 
Disabilities are actually part of our everyday lives. There is a, an expression that the disabled community doesn't necessarily uh, like for, for many complicated reasons, but it's a good one to keep in mind. And that expression is, we are actually all temporarily abled. So if you are not disabled, you are temporarily abled. At some point in your life, you may break your arm. You may have a child and be nursing that child for about a year, which means that you spend most of your life one-handed. You might have a concussion. You might be drunk. You might have to pay a bill while you're drunk. All of these things can come up and they can be part of your life. You might have, or you may be sitting next to someone, or you may be best friends with somebody who has an invisible disability that they are not even aware of. Motion triggered seizures. Some people can go through their entire lives and then suddenly they're 30 or 40 years old and some kind of motion triggers a seizure and they never even had any idea that that was a reality in their lives. So these are some of the reasons why this matters. They can be invisible and they can still deeply impact the user's experience with your product. So this GIF gives you a good example of, some, of what somebody sees if they're colorblind, and if you can imagine how that might play its way into products. The other thing to keep in mind about why this matters, and a great argument when you're talking with stakeholders, is that our population is aging. We are not having children as fast as we are getting old, and we are living longer than ever before. By the time you're 40, your optometrist can actually start to predict what your new prescription for your glasses will look like at very exact degrees every five years, which means that you are basically guaranteed as you age to become a low vision user at some point in your life. So when you're thinking about disabilities, and designing your products with disabilities in mind, to quote someone that I recently met and greatly admire, you are designing for future versions of ourselves. Accessibility also matters because it's literally making our, its way into everyday products that all of us use right now. So here's some quotes that you're familiar with, which I actually won't say because when I was rehearsing this last night, I triggered something. <laughs> and ignoring these guidelines, ignoring the WCAG guidelines, which we'll be talking about a little bit in here, will actually put you potentially at risk of legal action, especially if you are a government, university, or any other kind of public institution or an organization that actually has the reputation of having a fair amount of money. The statistics as far as lawsuits are actually going up rapidly right now. At this point in 2019, there have already been three times the number of lawsuits, the total number of lawsuits, filed in 2018. And 2018, I think, was around five times the number of lawsuits that had been filed in 2017. So you can see that these numbers are rising rapidly. And so if no other argument convinces your stakeholders, hopefully this one will. Lawsuits can be expensive and a PR nightmare. The other reason why this matters is because inaccessible design is, and code is exclusionary. And again, don't lead with this with a stakeholder because you'll turn them off. <laughs> so who benefits? Well, everyone. Everyone benefits. There are distinct categories of users that we should talk about because as you're moving forward and creating your products, simply having these types of users in mind will increase the accessible nature of your products. It's actually pretty amazing how just knowing that this is true will make a significant difference and that education has a big impact. So the first one is the obvious one, one that we're all familiar with and that a lot of the big tech organizations have been doing a great job building some pretty fantastic tools for. And these are individuals without vision. And these people will rely on a screen reader. So they rely on the ability of your computer to decipher, or their computer, to decipher what is on your page. 
This means that they need good semantic markup. They need good code. They need well-considered document object models. So if you're a developer, always thinking about your document object model and how it's truly laid out is really important. I'll give you a really good example. Our colleagues and I were looking at my, some of my colleagues and I were looking at a site that uh, had been uh, built a number of years ago and trying to figure out why a form was really difficult to use. And what we figured out is that the form had been created in two columns and then the submit button was at the bottom. But the way that the document object model was actually structured, the first column, the submit button, and the second column. So you can imagine that that could actually create a problem for someone who's not cited because they will experience the submit button before they see the entire second column worth of fields. Really thinking through that is important. Clear language is very important, and this is important for multiple categories of users, and mouse-free interfaces. Think about it. If you're blind, you can't use a mouse because you have to be able to see where the mouse is pointing. The other category or the other kind of group of people that is part of this category, even though you wouldn't naturally think of them as being part of this category, are people who speak a different language from the natural language of your website. Why does this actually fit in here? Because now there are fantastic auto translation tools that exist. And so if somebody is a Swedish speaker, for example, and they come to an English speaking website, they can use those auto translation tools to translate the text on the page to Swedish. But they can't do this if the text isn't truly text. Also impacted are individuals with low vision. These people will rely on Zoom functionality. They might use a screen reader, they might not. They might require high contrast settings in the same way that, as it turns out, everyone in this room automatically makes use of high contrast settings when you take your responsive screens out into a sunny day. Um, they may rely on large clickable areas or simple visual cues, and they might rely on common design patterns. So they might expect that your share icon looks like what they know of as a share icon and that they're not having to try to decipher what it means because it looks like something different. Um, they're also very likely to be using the mobile experience of your site even if they're on a desktop. And this is something that I think a lot of us, I know I've been guilty of forgetting this often, but a lot of us often forget this, that sometimes people will have the desktop simply because it enables them to have a much larger version of the mobile experience and see things significantly bigger. Colorblind users are also an important and significant group to think about. Colorblind users will include people who are using high contrast. They might include you when you're out in a space with a lot of glare or out in the snow. Um, they also include people who are actually colorblind, which is a larger percentage of the population than you would think. About 10% of men are colorblind, um, and my husband included, as a matter of fact. And I'm going to kill the slideshow for a moment because I want to show you what happens to these fields when you're colorblind. So this is a very common failure that occurs here. We can go ahead and get rid of this so that it can be a little larger. Um, so a very common error that occurs is when you're, when you're creating error states on form fields. And it's indicated by color only. So when you saw that in color, assuming you're not colorblind, you saw that that first field had a red border around it. So you knew that it had an error. But now you're looking at it in black and white and you can't actually see that at all anymore. So obviously the second field is going to give you significantly more information because it has other cues that give you what you need to know. All right, let me uh, move out of this. Oh, right, I also wanted to show you low vision or glare so that you have a sense of what you, you could be experiencing there as well. All right. What is that 
Oh, that tool's in the, in the slides. That's called No Coffee. The No Coffee filter, it's a Chrome extension, and it's linked in the slides. So we'll get there. There's a few great extensions that I really like to use. Also, we're not going to go into this in depth, but other people to consider, people with low or no hearing. And then also people who might have some kind of a speech impairment or, or not really be able to pronounce words correctly. <coughs> Maybe they're drunk, for example. Um, but we are going to talk a bit about individuals with motor impairment. They might only have use of one hand. They might have tremors. If you've ever known someone who's on chemotherapy, it's very normal for people on chemotherapy to have pretty significant tremors, which can make it very hard for them to, to touch something or to use a mouse. Um, and they might also be relying on any number of alternate input devices. There are some pretty significant uh, variations in input devices that exist out there. Um, and keyboard only is a very common one. They might be using devices called switch devices. Um, and I was going to pick on the, the Drupal Camp LA website a little bit here. <laughs> I did check with John beforehand. Um, so if I'm it's using, good for us. what's that? It's good feedback for us. <laughs> All right. So if I'm using a keyboard, if I'm attempting to navigate this website with my keyboard, I'm not allowed to use my mouse. So let me get through my million extensions first and get into here. So the first thing I get is the skip to navigation link, which is almost good, but actually bad, which we'll talk about later. Yes, you have a question. No? OK. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so th that's the first thing that I get. Now, if I use it, I'm not going to, because if I use it, it actually puts me into this kind of weird loop. So that's why it's bad. So I'm not going to use it. The first place I go is to Drupal Camp LA, that logo. Can you what see you the, the focus? My, my tab key. That's all? That's all. Okay. I'm using my tab key. So now the first thing I get is, is the focus around the logo. The next thing that happens, I don't know if you can see it, but it's gone to login. And now it's gone to register. Now it's gone to not registered sign up now. And now I don't know where it is. Sessions, there it is, OK. So now it's up at the top. So this is a document object model. It's going in directions that I don't expect. So the document object model itself is out of order and confusing. What did I not get to at all? Menu. The main menu. I had to use that skip to navigation in order to get to the main menu. But I know, because I tested this a fair amount, that if I get there, then I'll be in a weird loop that'll be difficult to get out of. So I didn't go there at all. Um, so now I come down here, and in order to tab through each of these, I, I literally have to tab through every single piece. So this is a lot of work for me to navigate around this page with a tab key. Now the good news is if you go to one of the forms, they work pretty well. So I won't pick on those. Um, but that gives you a little bit of insight into what somebody, into a not terrible experience. By the way, I've seen significantly worse. I'm actually picking on one that's not bad. It, it works. It can be used by comparison. Can you explain why the jump to navigation is bad and what would be better? Yeah, I'll, I'll explain that when we get a little further in, because that that's an important one. Um, but I do have a slide for that. So call me out if I don't actually go into it, if I skip over that too quickly. We're also needing to, this is the category that's most often forgotten but is the largest category by far of disabilities that exist within the world overall. It's also the largest category of temporal or situational disabilities. And these are individuals with cognitive impairment, learning disabilities, anxiety disabilities, and who knows what else, post-traumatic stress disorder, any number of things, being temporarily distressed for some reason, maybe even literally being distressed for the very reason that they're coming onto your site, if there's something going wrong in their lives and they're coming to you for support. These individuals rely on clarity, human language, consistent design patterns. These individuals can be highly susceptible to time-sensitive experiences. 
I'm guessing a lot of the people in this room have either worked on or have, or at least have experienced in a negative way, some kind of a situation where you're trying to purchase something or sign up for something, and then a timer starts, and you only have a certain amount of time to finish that transaction. As soon as that happens, somebody with anxiety or attention deficit disorder, somebody who is in some way feeling some kind of cognitive pressure or potentially has a learning disability and needs a little bit more time because they're having trouble reading what's on the page, any of those types of individuals will start to feel undue emotional strain at the moment that that timer starts. So that's something to keep in mind because there are really valid reasons why those timers exist on sites. And if you're somebody who has one, there's probably a very good reason why you do. But having this in mind will help you create an environment that will be friendlier. Like just adding the ability to extend the time. Exactly. Exactly. Or making it bigger, or clearer, or giving some kind of way out for somebody. Yes. Um, these individuals are also potentially susceptible to cognitive overload. So there's that sort of user experience design rule of seven items at once, plus or minus two, and any more than that will be uh, too much kind of cognitive information for somebody to take in at once. That's definitely something to think about when you're thinking about people with any kind of cognitive disability or learning disability or dyslexia or anxiety, that if you're asking them to look at too much, if you're creating Craigslist, you could potentially be creating a stressful situation. These individuals are also easily frustrated. So when does this matter? Well, this really matters when it comes into forms, especially if there's going to be some kind of a legal transaction occurring. So if your forms are confusing, or if they're not able to properly fill out your form over and over and over again, and they keep getting error messages, and those error messages don't help them resolve the problem, that could cause them to become increasingly frustrated as they're trying to work with your, with your site. But overall, accessibility benefits absolutely everyone. And a couple of examples, things that were created with accessibility in mind and turned out to be products that everybody is now using in the mainstream world right now would include things like Alexa and will remain nameless, <laughs> autocomplete, and device vibrations. These were all originally conceived of for purposes of accessibility and are now mainstream technologies that we all benefit from on a daily basis. A great quote from Eve Anderson at Google, the accessibility problems of today are the mainstream breakthroughs of tomorrow. So now let's get into the, the technical and the practical and answer the question of the skip to uh, navigation. We're going to start with what are called the WCAG principles, the web content authoring or the bleh, web content guidelines, accessibility. Bleh, there's two. There's ATAG and WCAG. WCAG is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and we're going to start with those. So those guidelines have this. What I said was a very unfortunate acronym. We kind of like to joke about it, which is poor, but this is a very important acronym. You want your digital experiences to be poor experiences. You want them to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So what does this actually mean? Perceivable means that colors are not going to be the only source of information. We already looked at that, if we're thinking about somebody who might be colorblind or somebody has something set to high contrast. Screen readers are able to access content, so it can actually be perceived. Transcripts or captions are available for videos. Audio descriptions are available for videos. And content can still be accessed when somebody zooms in or out, that they can actually figure out what's there and find it. It needs to be operable, which is pretty straightforward. It needs to be something that people can actually make use of. The links can be clicked regardless of motor skills or device. Menus can be accessed and forms can be submitted. It needs to be understandable insofar as the language being human friendly and clear. Even if you're designing something for a specific industry, it's worthwhile to try not to fall into industry specific jargon because that can be unclear even within the industry itself. Links won't just read click here. We're actually going to look at that in a little bit. 
through a screen reader. And affordances in design are very clear. So what this means is that a button looks like a button, a link looks like a link. Things, the design elements of your items, a form field looks like a form field, a date picker looks like a date picker, so that people can actually tell what they're supposed to do with the item. These sound basic, but most of the systems that are out there do actually violate most of these principles in some way or another. Um, your icons make sense. This one's really important. We're going to talk about this when we get into development. Your form fields are labeled programmatically. Very, very important. Again, we're going to, we have an entire slide just about that. Your data models, especially your document object model and, and what types of data is being requested when you're in a form field, those are clear and table headers and captions aren't missing. And we also have a slide specifically on that one. Robust is probably the most complicated of these four guidelines in terms of what it means and also in terms of implementation. From a practical level for each person sitting in this room as someone who is thinking about Drupal-related products or potentially building Drupal products, what it really means is good, clean code, good semantic markup, nice, well-formed document object models. Because if you start there, and if you start clean and you have a logical structure, then you are going to be creating something that will more naturally adapt as technology advances. And that will adapt as people start using their own customized adaptive technologies. Because this is also what happens often in accessibility communities, is that individuals have very specific needs. So the technologies that they are using to work with your product might be something completely customized to them. So you can't possibly design for everything and test for everything. And the only way to really do that is to just be clean, create responsive products, think mobile first if you're doing a web-based product, and make sure that you are semantic and that your document object model is clean. So how do we do this? Just keeping track of time here, because I definitely want to leave time for questions. Um, so I'm going to break up how we do this into four different sections. Um, we're going to talk first about what to think about when you're in the definition and design stage of a project. So assuming probably that it's a brand new project and you're starting from the beginning. And then we're going to talk about things to think about when you're developing. And then we're also going to talk about testing and iteration. And hopefully, I'll have time to demonstrate some of these to you. And then we'll, we'll look at ongoing upkeep. And I was trying to be funny here with this gulp um, content management, because we all know that no matter how well we start a product, if we turn it over to a client who enters content, and as, uh, as Rick was showing us, puts paragraphs into their um, whatever you give them, that they could completely destroy the accessibility of your product right then and there. So how do we handle this? So starting with definition of de and design, this is the area that I mostly live in. So it's probably the area that's most fleshed out, but I'm trying to give valuable uh, information in all of the sections. So the best way to build accessible products and to be easily accessible is to just keep these types of users in your mind when you're creating your definition, your product definition. And one of the great ways to do this is with personas. So if you're working with a client who's not willing to pay for personas, or if you're working um, in a company and they are like, oh, we're not going to spend time on personas, don't allow that to happen. Just take five minutes on your own and you know, don't bill for it and write your own quick persona just so that you remember to be aware of these considerations when you're designing and when you're defining the product. Because that really is 90% of what's going to get you an accessible product, is just remembering that these things are real, that people's lives have these, uh, these elements to them. So here's an example of two personas that are built with accessibility in mind. And I'm only going into the accessibility considerations. 
So you're not just throwing some kind of an accessibility consideration or a disability into a persona for the sake of doing it. It needs to be something that's actually relevant to the persona and the product that you're building. So in this case, for a travel-related product, I have Amy, who absolutely loves to travel, but she always needs that reassurance that her family is back there for her. The considerations that are built in here include relying on a mobile device um, for over 90% of the time because she's on the go. That is a real accessibility consideration. Again, think back to the reality that a lot of people who are low vision are probably viewing your site even on a desktop using the mobile layout. So as long as you know that you have a persona who is mobile only or primarily mobile, you'll be thinking about that as you go. Also, I added in here, she's often in areas with limited Wi-Fi and cell reception, which means maybe she won't always get the images that you might have. So she might be uh, sort of reflective somewhat of a blind user. She also struggles with anxiety and can get very nervous if something is confusing or time sensitive. So now we're adding that kind of time consideration in there. Another example would be smart headphones for children. And this is Bennett, who loves music. The way that we built some accessibility considerations into Bennett that are perfectly normal for a persona, not something that in any way we're, we're trying to kind of just randomly plop information into uh, an, a user in order to sort of force something in. Um, as a child requires headphones that don't exceed safe levels. So now we're thinking about um, hearing sensitivity, sound levels. Cords are a strangling hazard. And it's a, this individual is extremely sensitive to touch, which can trigger negative emotions. So we're talking about a device that he actually wears, and he's sensitive to touch. So how do we think about that? And just doing this will help you significantly as you move forward. Be very creative in the stories you tell because your users are diverse. Nobody is quote unquote normal. Everybody has different ways of experiencing what they're working with. Um, I also like to think about really designing with these guidelines in mind and thinking beyond just the visual. So how does your user interact? Are there non-visual responses or, or um, indications, interactions that you can actually enable? And this is an example right here. If you have a text field, simply giving the quick access to voice input in, in case somebody might not be able to type in whatever is going into that field. Also, we've already looked at this one, but being aware of what's going on on forums. How understandable are your error states and your contextual messages? Can your user perceive where the error has occurred? And can they get back to it easily in order to fix it? Another thing to think about comes straight from uh, Google's material guidelines, material design guidelines, which specify for uh, buttons for mobile devices. You should be thinking about a touchable area of 48 by 48 DP as the minimum size for a button. Now that doesn't necessarily mean the visual size, that has to do with the touchable size. So you can actually see that indicated here where the pink part isn't necessarily uh, visual, but any of that area will activate the actual click. Um, Apple's human interface design guidelines are very close. They're 44 by 44. And, um, and then you're also considering the sensitivity of any buttons that you place and their proximity to another button. So for example, if your purchase and your cancel buttons are too close to each other, you could be creating an anxiety-inducing, frustrating situation really for anyone. I think it was two nights ago that my husband swore after filling in a form for about 10 minutes because he accidentally hit cancel instead. Um, there's a great link here to more about accessible, uh, designing accessible buttons. And you'll get these slides afterwards. I'll link them to the uh, session note. Um, so there's also some actual very clear guidelines in WCAG that have to do with color contrast and use of color. Uh, so this first one, 141, <coughs> has to do with color not being the only means of visual communication. I think we've, we've spoken about that enough. So we'll move on to the next one, which has to do with contrast levels, one, four, three. And this one's really tricky for designers, 
because designers really love to, to play with colors in, in very nuanced ways. So this can be, if you know, you're working with a designer, if you are a designer yourself, this can be one of the hardest ones to grapple with. The great news is that there are fantastic tools that give you the actual numbers so that you don't have to think um, perceptually, you can actually literally just get the numbers and, and have that conversation with facts in hand. Um, and this is there, these resources are linked here on the slide deck. Um, but anytime text is smaller than 18 point, or what would be 18 point, your color contrast should be 4.5 to 1. Um, what does that actually mean? In, in, you know, it's hard to kind of visualize what that means. So for reference, black to white is 27 to 1. So we're not actually asking for a lot in 4.5 to 1 when you think that black to white is 27 to 1. We're, we're asking for a very kind of low range. Um, now, you will see that I have a third line here that says for, for level triple A. Most people don't try to reach triple A because it's nearly impossible, largely because in some cases the guidelines for triple A are actually um, in opposition with each other. And what you might do for one group directly uh, opposes what you might do for another. But if you want to have your contrast ratios be good enough for level triple A, then you're looking at a seven to one. Again, that's not asking for a lot. It's actually pretty reasonable. Um, this is an example here of contrastchecker.com, which I love and is linked through this slide deck. And it shows you with these um, circles and checks and color and buttons which, uh, which levels you are getting. And it gives you the actual ratio right there. Uh, this is another great tool, which is also linked. It's the one that's the color palette builder. And just to show you how that comes out, if you are a designer or you're working with a designer and you want to throw the brand colors into something and actually see which colors can be used against each other, this gives you that information right there. So it can be used right at the beginning of the process and ease that problem that you can encounter where somebody falls in love with those variations. All right. Um, the other thing to really keep in mind are interaction states, and this is often forgotten. I can't tell you the number of times I've worked on a project where comps did not include the variety of interaction states that can happen. Um, so the Google Material Design Guidelines, there are actually literally some challenges in there that probably need to be fixed that, that I could point to, but we won't bother with, with that. I'll, I'll just show that this shows you kind of the plethora of interaction states that you might need to consider. Um, the other thing, and if you're a designer in the room, this slide might make you angry, I apologize, but there is this, there's still today this kind of hold of the idea of the pixel perfect design. And unfortunately, pixel perfect is exclusionary. It locks people out because when you're thinking about accessibility, you're thinking about the fact that people might be changing the zoom on their screen, they might have font preferences set on their local device that change the font that they're using. There's another extension that I absolutely love called Open Dyslexic, which changes the font so that it's easier for somebody to read if they're dyslexic. Um, there's, there's any number of things that people might be doing that you are completely unaware of. And if you try to hold to pixel perfect, then it won't really um, allow them to enjoy your site in the same way or your product. Also, it's really important to think about content strategy, to think about clear language, to write for real humans. I'm going to bypass this because you can come back to it later. And because it's very important for me to go ahead and share this terrifying slide with you, because this is real. Uh, so, it, it might be a surprise to you to know that as somebody who's building digital products, you literally have the opportunity to put somebody's life in danger. But if you are interested in animations, and believe me, I've worked on many sites that include animations that violate the guideline listed here, where it actually is dangerous for somebody who might be prone to seizures to interact with your site. Um, so definitely keep in mind that animations need to be done well, and it's very important before you start going into working with animations or videos or any kind of flickering that you take a look at this guideline and understand 
what's safe and what isn't, and how to make sure that somebody who is susceptible can actually avoid having to experience whatever animations you create. All right, now onto the fun part, development. So we've already talked about this, but your semantic markup and your document object model are really the key things to ensuring that your site is going to be accessible. I was going to play a screen reader, but we really don't have time. So um, if you're curious later today and want to come experience a screen reader with me, I'm more than happy to go through that with you and show it off. But in terms of a strong page structure, you really want to be thinking about HTML5 regions and ARIA landmarks and using them correctly because they will help people navigate through your site in a much cleaner way. You're also going to want to think very carefully about header order. I can't tell you the number of times in remediation projects I've seen people use headers as a means of design not as a means of actually indicating the semantic structure of the page. And this is a huge accessibility failure because those headers are one of the key ways that people who rely on screen readers or keyboard access to your site can actually navigate around your site easily. Another thing to really consider, what we spoke about earlier, is Drupal Camp's uh, sort of failure with that skip to navigation link at the top of the page. What that actually needs to be is a skip to main content link, not a skip to navigation link. It should be taking you to the first H, or hopefully the only H1 on your page, which, is your, which mirrors your page title, ideally. It should take you there and drop you right into the page so that you don't have to go through all of that branding and all of that other information, all of the, the navigation, everything that's there over and over and over and over again every time you go to a page on the site. That link is in your Drupal code base, Drupal core and all of the base themes that come in Drupal core, that link is there. That link is in most contributed themes that you might make use of when you're going to go ahead and, and work on theming. So really, all you have to do here is not break it, which is cool. Um, then we have tips for improving content understanding as an actual developer. So um, the very first WCAG criterion is something that you probably have a clear picture of now uh, throughout the course of everything that we've already talked about. But all non-text content that is presented needs to be available in a text alternative or somehow available so that users who require that text can get that information. The most obvious version of this would be the image and the image requiring alt text. Alt text should be the equivalent of what the user would have gotten from the image. So it's, it's not alt text to try to cram keywords in. It's not alt text saying image of somebody because the screen reader already reads image. So if you put image of rain, then the screen reader will read image, image of rain. Uh, but it's the place where you put whatever it is the experience that that user is missing when they don't get to see that image. Now, some of this is more content related, um, but it's important for you as, de as a developer to think about how can you require that help text and help text and how can you make it easy for good help text to be put in there. Um, probably about 20 years ago, I had the opportunity to meet kind of a legend in the accessibility field, um, a pioneer named Dr. John Slayton, a blind web developer from about 20 years ago. And he said to me that basically alt text is meant to give the non-sighted user the experience that the image was intended to create. And in essence, alt text should be haiku. Um, all right, there's another great one. We, um, it, WordPress does this all the time. Websites do this all the time. Drupal views do this all the time. So when you add a more link to a view, to, to the uh, values that are returned in a view, the default language of that more link is more or read more. So what happens with when, when a screen reader user is engaging with this, there's a way for a screen reader user to quickly, you know, they'll go through the page, they'll see what's there, and then they'll pull up all of the links to go back to something that they might have wanted to read. Unfortunately, when those links just say 
learn more, read more, more, click here. That's actually what the screen reader user experiences. They pull up that list of links to figure out what they want to go back to, and they literally hear, learn more, learn more, learn more, learn more, learn more. Although a little bit faster, because most screen reader users will speed up the, the speed of their reader. So this is really not helpful and doesn't enable them to navigate around your site. There's a really great way around this, which is the visually hidden class. So, and this is Drupal. Drupal has the visually hidden class. This isn't necessarily, WordPress probably has its own. Um, but if you just use the visually hidden class, what you're doing is you're using a technique called CSS clip. And you're making sure that that text exists on the page. It just doesn't display, which is great because then what it can actually read is read more about, and then you use the token for the node title, and only the person using the screen reader or making use of one of those shortcuts to see the list of links has to get the rest of that information. And the rest of your cited users can just see, learn more, and it makes perfect sense to them. One of the many reasons I love Drupal, because it's something like that simply embedded right within. Um, so tips for improving content understanding. I'm going to kind of go through this pretty quickly. Um, but basically, it's important as a developer to always make sure that your code is programmatically labeled in some way. For example, if you have form fields, it's really important that the label is programmatically associated with the field. Otherwise, when your user tabs into the field, they're not going to know what they're supposed to enter. And that's simply done with the ID, using an ID, and then for, and using that ID. Field sets also need to have a legend. If you don't want the legend to be visible, just use the CSS clip technique. Yes? What about, can you go back to that? Yeah. Um, oftentimes, you'll see the label wrapped around the text and also the field. So it's implied that the label so, is for the field. Yeah, it's not, you don't want to go with implications. Some screen readers will actually be able to use that. Some screen readers will understand placeholder text and so, and so forth as well, but not all of them will. So it's important to not rely on the implication and to genuinely programmatically code it in. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, all right, so, uh, so back to legend. Very important that your field sets have a legend. Again, because your screen reader user or your keyboard user could just go straight to a list of all of the field sets on the page. And if they don't have legends, then they just see field set, field set, field set, field set, and they don't know what to do. Iframes, same thing. Your iframes are likely to have content within them that's not accessible. So it's important to keep that in mind. But it's also important to give it a title so that people know what it is. And then tables. Tables need to have captions. You know, I didn't know this until fairly recently, and I've been doing accessibility work forever. But if a table doesn't have a caption, it, it's also very hard to figure out what that table is when you're trying to get through really quickly. And if it doesn't have a table header with, uh, you know, if, if you actually have headers, if that's not programmatically coded with the scope, then it's very hard for somebody to know what those are. Yes? Exactly, exactly. I love that. Isn't Drupal great? Um, all right, so then the other thing is tips for freeing your site from pixel perfection. Allow your users to change their font. Allow your users' settings to reconstruct the page. Allow them to zoom and use things like M's, REMs, and percents for sizes. This is even important when it has to do with padding. I actually recently experienced um, one of my, I had a student, a dyslexic student, who came up to me and said, I'm looking at this article on medium.com and I can't figure out why the text is overlapping. It's medium, shouldn't they know what they're doing? And she sent me a screenshot and I didn't know she was dyslexic until she sent me the screenshot and I saw that she was using open dyslexic. So, so I asked her and, and got that information. But it took me a little while to figure out what was wrong because I made the assumption that medium knew what they were doing. So like, why is the text in this paragraph starting to overlap? 
Well, what I finally, finally thought to do was to take a look at the code, and I figured out that they were actually using point sizes for the line height, which meant that when she changed her font to open dyslexic, which had a larger height than what they were using, it started to overlap because of the strict point size. All they need to do is change that to rem or m or percent, and the problem will be solved. The other important thing, don't half-ass it. And this is legit, because if you have a site that promises to be accessible and isn't, you're actually creating a more frustrating situation, especially if your user goes down the path of, say, filling out a 10-page form, and then suddenly they can't submit the form. Now they're going to be very frustrated, whereas if, it, if at the beginning you just said, look, sorry, this isn't accessible, here's a number to call, then they wouldn't have filled out that 10-page form. So that's something to also really think about. Um, I am very much out of time, which I knew I was going to be. So in the last stage here, we'll talk about testing and iteration. Test with real people. Include people with different abilities in your test base. 30%. So one of the things that happens, this number is very important because one of the things that happens is pretty much everybody who has a site will run their site through automated disability testing tools and it will pass or not and then they'll think, okay, we're good to go. But 30% is the number or is the percentage of accessibility issues that automated testing tools are capable of catching. So if you're relying entirely on automated testing tools and you've gotten to 30, then, then you've really only gotten to 30%. And that's because if you think about all of the things that we spoke about, so much of it is very subjective and about understanding and not really something that a computer can figure out. These are a couple of my favorite testing tools, which I'm gonna go through very quickly because we're out of time. Definitely test your site with the keyboard only. My favorite thing to do is get rid of my, I don't actually use a mouse, I use a trackball, but I move it to another room so that I'm not even tempted to use it. And then I simply try to work through the site with my keyboard. Great thing to do, you'll find lots of problems that way. Lots of great screen reading tools. Again, I'm more than happy to demonstrate some of these to you. If you're using a Mac, which it looks like most of you are, VoiceOver is built in for free, so you have no reason not to use it. Um, and I think Narrator is now built into Windows, so I, I think most of you have that as well. Your, your clients will start adding content. We are out of time, so I'm just gonna let you know that this is here so that when you come back to the slides, you can find this. Um, there's a, something called a tag, which is the authoring tool accessibility guidelines. As people who work with Drupal, we're working with a CMS, which means that our users are creating content, which means that we actually do have to adhere to a tag guidelines as well as we tag guidelines in, we tag guidelines in order to be truly accessible. Um, so definitely come back to these and take a look at some of the options. Um, also, the session that I'm giving tomorrow is entirely um, about using design systems, which can really help you when it comes to handing something over to your client and expecting them to maintain some level of accessibility. Lots of resources in here that I'm going to let you come to yourselves. And a Drupal checklist, because Drupal has some great ways that are built in, and as long as you don't break them, Dr Drupal's just kind of awesome. And that being said, I have two minutes, <laughs> but I'm happy to answer questions longer um, for anyone with questions. Yes? In the science, I, I, I noticed you had sign and truth. Mm -hmm. How do you make it read for eye contest? Well, that's one of the reasons why accessibility, uh, automated accessibility testing tools are only going to capture about 30% of your issues because the automated tool isn't going to know if your icon makes sense or not. It's just gonna know whether or not your icon has uh, the proper alt text or is properly skipped, because that's the other challenge is if you have things that are presentation only and they're not marked. I didn't go into, there's so much more. We could spend days on this. Um, but something that I didn't even cover in this slide deck at all is making sure that things that are presentation only are properly marked as presentation only. Um, so if your icon is purely for presentation and there's a text version next to it, then that will, um, you'll, you'll want to make sure that you have that as well. 
Right, so what you're gonna need to do then is make sure that you have either a label in there or you mark it as presentation only. Um, and then you have an alternative, or uh, yeah, or alt text. Although alt text is a little funny when it comes to icon fonts. Aria text. Aria text. Yes, thank you. But that won't help you if the person doesn't see the icon because they're just not downloading it. So that's something to think about as well. Or it's just not rendering. Yeah. Any other questions? Where can we download? I'm going to attach it to the presentation node on the website. And then once the video's there, I know um, John's really good about getting those videos up. So that'll be there as well. Yeah. Anything else? Well, hit me up later today if you want to see anything, if you want me to demonstrate a screen reader or anything like that. Um, and thank you.